Let's pray as we, as we come to this passage now. Lord, your word is food for us. We pray that you would feed us again today. Lord, this is a precious passage. We ask for your spirit to be ministering, showing us the glory of Jesus, showing us what he has accomplished. And we pray this for your son's sake. Amen. Uh, please be seated, and if you'd open up Leviticus chapter 16, page 118 of the Church Bibles. The Day of Atonement frames for us a big problem that needs working out, and it's this. If God is holy, and if people are sinful, how is it that God and people can be brought together uh, into fellowship? So let's think a little bit more deeply about this problem. Uh, it's there in Genesis 2. Uh, we have Adam and Eve. They're living in perfect harmony with one another and with God. We're told that the Lord God had planted a garden in Eden. And that they dwelt together there in perfect fellowship. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. That's Genesis 2, verse 22. And then in Genesis 3, we learn that Adam and Eve have sinned against God. And that this led to them hiding from God. And being expelled from the safety of the garden. The Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid. Notice that word there. That's the first time that fear has been felt by a human. Many times afterwards, but here's the first time. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and to take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And then the passage goes on. So the Lord God banished him. <laughs> banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So please can we notice some key idea, ideas there. Sin came and that led to shame. <coughs> Where are you? So there was hiding and a sense of being uncovered, being exposed. And then there was banishment from the garden and broken relationships as well. Now we know this alienation to be true in our own uh, personal relationships. When people sin against one another, it's rare that the relationship remains unchanged. So life doesn't just carry on as normal. When two people have argued, maybe even years ago, if it's not dealt with, if the problem isn't named and atoned for, there won't be the same level of intimacy as there was before. They might not even be able to tolerate being around one another. The other person ends up being left out in the cold, banished, if you like. So we notice the experience of Adam and Eve plays out in small ways in our own lives with our nearest and dearest. Sin that leads to broken fellowship. And today we're thinking about how is it that God and people can be together if there's such a problem as sin. Well, in chapter 16, verse 1, if you take a look down, the Lord gives these instructions about the Day of Atonement, hot on the heels of Nadab and Abihu, who died when they approached the Lord. We've been taught that access to God is not on man's terms. You cannot just come to God on your own terms. And then verse 2, the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he's not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place, behind the curtain, in front of the atonement cover of the ark or else he will die, for I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. We've spoken already about the design of the tabernacle, uh, the most holy place where God dwelt. It's a really fascinating design, so much so that a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, a friend was studying architecture at university, and they said for the dissertation, pick a building and do your, a structure and do your dissertation on that. He said, great, I'll do it on the tabernacle. Can you imagine the surprise that that caused in the architecture department? He said, no, it's really symbolic and significant. Let's think about some of that now. The most holy place, you'll recall, that was the square 
that was in that tent structure. Do you remember? I've had out the lovely structure. That was the square, a perfect square. And it's the place where God dwelt, where his glory filled in Exodus chapter 40. The most holy place is described as a cube. Now, if you're, if you're taking notes, uh, in 2 Chronicles 3.8, we get that. In Ezekiel 41, verse 4, we get reference to the cube. And another important cube we find in the Bible is the heavenly city in Revelation 21, 15 to 16. So we're meant to think cube, heavenly city, the place where God dwells. Uh, Revelation 21, the city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. So the most holy place is to represent heaven to us, as we see that. Whereas the other part of the tent, and we're thinking of the, the rectangle that extended out from that, that represents earth. And that is the place where the priests go on a daily basis to, to perform uh, so many of their, their rituals. And it's why Moses told them to build the tabernacle according to the Lord's design. They couldn't just make it from their own measurements. Oh, let's take it out of foot there. Let's lift it up. Wouldn't it be nice to have a different aspect? They couldn't do that. It's to represent heaven and earth. And they're told, Aaron's told, he cannot come in whenever he chooses to the most holy place. But this is where the Day of Atonement starts to answer the question about how, ex how access is granted. Verse 3. Firstly, he's to take the blood of a bull and a ram for a sin offering. Now that's what we would expect, right? <coughs> so in chapter 4, we saw that blood needed to be offered with the sin offering for forgiveness. For the forgiveness of sin. And Aaron, the high priest, must take uh, the bull, verse 6, to make atonement for himself. Verse 7, then he presents two goats before the Lord at the entrance to the <coughs> tent. So it must have been quite a logistical nightmare. But he's got the goats in front of him, and he's casting lots. And <coughs> which one is going to be for the sacrifice? Which one is going to be a scapegoat? As Isabel read, you might have heard that word and thought, I recognise that. We've taken the word scapegoat into the English language for when someone is, um, they take the hit for everyone else. Maybe a politician has made the scapegoat so that the government can carry on and, and they bear that. Well, there's a scapegoat, one that is sent out, lays his hands on, on that, and, it, and it will be, verse 10, sent into the wilderness. Then he slaughters the bull, verse 11, and makes atonement for himself and his household. Now, atonement is a word that they made up in the English language, I think, in the 16th century. And I remember this being explained in the sermon at my wedding, and you should always remember the sermon uh, at your wedding. It's very clear to me. I remember the preacher saying, atonement. They made that word up to describe what God does with this blood that is presented. At one moment. They didn't have a word for what happens when God and people are brought together. We'll make one up. Atonement. At one moment. That's what happens. It's the Hebrew word, uh, kippur which means something like to make one by covering. To make one by covering. The bull's blood, verse 14, is taken behind the curtain. Remember the significance of that. That's the place where only once a year someone could go, and it was the high priest with the blood of, of the sacrifice. He goes behind the curtain, he sprinkles it with his finger on the atonement cover, which is the lid of the ark. Now, the ark is understood to be a kind of throne. It represents a throne of God. Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, more later, it, it's got cherubim on, on the top, and I had a little model here of it uh, the other day. And so he goes into this, this holy place where God dwells. The bull dies and the blood is shed so that that is possible. And it, it symbolises the earth. He goes from the earth through uh, into the holy of holies. And as he does that, he also, he's making atonement for people for the priests and for the unclean fallen creation. So we might want to think about the significance of that. The high priest is making all things new. And then in verse 21, in a vivid picture of how sin must lead to someone being alienated, Aaron lays his hands on the head of the scapegoat. So one of the goats gets killed, the other one gets sent out and sent away. Sent away. And it says, he shall send the goat away into the wilderness. So this represents the fact that sin must be removed from us as far as the east is from the west. We love to say that in Psalm 103, don't we? That is how far he has removed our sins from us. That's what the goat 
uh, is picturing for us. We then have further washing and cleansing rituals and rules about not working on the Sabbath. Here's a great thing. The feasts in Israel, of which there were many, we're just looking at two in our series, but there were many, they all represented a different aspect of the gospel. And each one was declared to be a Sabbath. So it didn't matter which day it landed on. They're like, we'll make that a Sabbath as well, because we need to celebrate rest. If this is about the gospel, we need to celebrate the rest that God gives us within. So they would declare them to be Sabbaths. And the Day of Atonement is a, is a Sabbath. And I hope we can see the significance of the Day of Atonement, Yom uh, Kippur. It is shadowing this go- these gospel truths to us of the blood of Christ which is being shed. And Hebrews is the letter of the Bible which really explains it for us and says, let's take apart the gospel significance of this event. It's designed to show how Jesus came to fulfill everything in the Old Testament. And I hope we remember and are reciting this to ourselves. What is, what is Leviticus? Leviticus is law fulfilled by Jesus. That's what we're saying Leviticus is. So it explains in Hebrews chapter 8 that Jesus is the true high priest that Aaron pointed to. So keep a finger in Leviticus 16 if you would and come to Hebrews chapter 8 please. Hebrews chapter 8, it's in the New Testament. Well, I'll give you a page number, and I can get that, page 1206, Hebrews chapter 8. Now, he's been making an extended argument saying, this, this is telling us this about Jesus from the Old Testament, this. And then he does that thing when someone's been making a really long argument, then chapter 8, verses 1 to 2, he goes, now I'll get to the point. Verse 1 of Hebrews 8, now the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. And then if you come on to Hebrews 9, just over the page, and verse 11. But when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. Here's the key thing. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all, so obtaining eternal redemption. So it says that Christ died and that his blood has provided access to God. And I want to say, if this is a new concept to you, I want to offer that to you this morning and say, there was one sacrifice made by Jesus. It's perfect. It's available to everyone, and it takes you to God as close as you could be. And it washes you clean, and it gives you a new start. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that, that we're, we're seeing there. Regardless of who you are, what you've done, how guilty you feel, the dirt that you might feel is on you, Jesus offers to take that away. And he doesn't just do it and say, yeah, I'll make you a worshipper acceptable to me. No, he says, come as a son, as come as a daughter, Come as a child of the king. Come come, come in. Come closer. He doesn't just tolerate those who come by the blood of Jesus, but he no longer counts their sin against them. Makes them clean and gives them a place in the family. And one day they will dwell with him upon the earth. Now perhaps there is something that you've done that makes you feel so guilty, so dirty. What this is telling us is that that can be washed away. Because the blood of Jesus, if you think about what blood normally does, blood normally makes things more dirty, right? This blood has the power to make everything clean. And it's the blood that's been shed for you. So that the curtain, do you remember the curtain which separated earth and heaven? Could be separated and so that you could go through and uh, in, into God's presence. And many of us have experienced this. That's what it is to be a Christian, to be forgiven by the blood of Jesus, to be brought uh, to God. And over time, those feelings that we have of inadequacy, of guilt, the things that we carry with us, we discover actually we can have a new identity through uh, God forgiving us uh, in, in Christ. And here's one of the really interesting things. I wonder if you know uh, about the curtain that divided the holy place and the most holy place, what's significant about it. When they were driven out of Eden, we're told that cherubim were placed at the edge of the garden with flaming swords saying you can't come in. 
In the curtain was woven cherubim. You can read about that in Exodus. Cherubim were woven into there. It's as if it's saying, that's the same barrier saying you can't come through. Only now, Christ has done something about it. Because his blood is presented, it was poured out when Christ died upon the cross. And listen to the incredible events in Jerusalem as Jesus dies. I'm going to read this from Matthew 27, verses 50 to 51. When Jesus cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's the curtain that's separating and saying that you can't come through to the holy place with God. And when we do Christianity Explore, which is a course we sometimes run here to explain the Christian faith, it's beautiful. In that video, they have an animation where you see the curtain being torn from the top to the bottom and light starts to break through as God says, come in. Come in. And significantly, it's, it's torn from the top. So this isn't the idea of people. It's not humanity's initiative from the bottom. It's from the top because God says, I'm going to open the way through the blood of Jesus. Listen to how Mark records it in his gospel. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This isn't me saying to you, come today to Jesus, come to God. This is God's idea. He's tearing the, the curtain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. So by tearing the curtain from the top to the bottom as Jesus died, God was saying that the way to the holy place had been opened up. It's why he now invites us to come in. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I, I will give you rest. And it's why he will accept anyone who comes uh, through that blood, and through the blood of Jesus. And the loving death of Jesus also provides grace for when relationships go wrong and people sin against one another. So I said at the start, the effect of angry words, of relationships going wrong, it naturally leaves the other person feeling out in the cold, doesn't it? And really, I'm convinced that Christianity provides the only real basis for proper reconciliation, because what it says is, you don't have to make that person pay. Someone else has paid. What it says is, you don't have to freeze them out and leave them out, because there is another who has been sent out into the wilderness. And it says, actually, do you see your sins and what a mess you are? And that you need forgiving? Can't you forgive them? It's the only real basis. Somebody has to pay. We get this. And so that's why it causes the dissonance in our relationships. Because we're like, well, I'm going to have to put it onto that person. Even thee or me, we're going to have to pay for that. But what happens if there's another? What happens if there's someone else who's sent out into the wilderness? And I just wonder if there's someone here who still needs to forgive someone today. You, you, you're, you're a Christian, you're wanting to do that, but you're lacking the impetus. I just want to say, actually, Jesus has provided the means for that. <clears throat> because he wants to take the rap that they actually can't take. And it could be the person's never asked for forgiveness, they've never recognised what they've done wrong. And it's not saying what they did was okay. But you know it's saying that someone else has been left out in the cold. The scapegoat. Lord Jesus. And friends, it is a beautiful thing. It's the basis for relationships being put back together. And it's actually on a global scale why we, say, why we say peace and reconciliation only really comes properly through the gospel. They might not accept they've done anything wrong, identify it, but we have the power to forgive. And can I say that as a releasing thing when we say, you know, you've hurt me, but there's another who's, who's taken that. God was left out in the cold so that we might never have to be. And brothers and sisters, that is the beauty of the gospel. It fixes our human relationships, but can I say, if you haven't yet become a Christian and believed in Jesus, it fixes the most important uh, relationship where there's a break for you. It fixes that with God, with your creator. And it's the only way to do life well, actually. It's certainly the only way to die confidently. How is it? That God and simple people can be brought back together. Well, can I send us back to Leviticus 16 and say, through the blood of the sacrifice. And he's saying, come in. Come in. God and simple people can be brought back together by the cross. 
God, I pray that we would be a community who rejoice in that. A community who rejoice in our relationship with God and with one another because it actually, it brings down all the barriers. You know, it's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful thing. And maybe you're sat here today and you're like, do you know what? I do need to ask forgiveness of someone. Go and do it today. Don't leave it here long. Go and do it today. It's why God will one day be able to live amongst people again. Even as his spirit now lives inside believers. So wonderfully God comes to live in us when we, when we come into relationship with him. He gives us his spirit. But there's something bigger than that. One day in Revelation 21 verse 3 we're told that God will dwell with people. And it says in Revelation 21 verse 3, look, God's dwelling place is now amongst people. Actually, if we wanted to put a paraphrase on that, we could say, is now amongst people again. Because do you see, from the garden, where they were once together in beautiful relationship, it's going to be recreated on the earth. Because God will come down from heaven when Christ returns and we're told there'll be a new earth where we will dwell with God again. So look, God's dwelling place is now amongst the people and he will dwell with them. That's possible because of the gospel. Simple people, wonderful God, brought back together through the blood of the sacrifice. Praise God for at one moment and for the day of atonement. Let's rejoice in these, these gospel, these deep gospel truths. And let's pray now. Lord, we see that the cherubim were woven into the curtain. A reminder, you can't come in. It casts our minds back to Eden. We recognise, Lord, that we've been, as humanity, shouldering uh, the burden of that sin. That means that there's just been broken relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that you've done something about that. We praise you that Jesus is the great high priest and that his blood has open the way. And I just pray for anyone who today, we all carry a sense of guilt for different things. Thank you that we can be washed clean through the blood of Jesus. That is no small thing, that is a massive thing. Lord, we pray that in our relationships with one another and with others, we might see that dynamic that we don't have to leave others um, cut off. Uh, don't have to break relationship because there is another actually uh, that's that's taken it all on themselves and that can bear even the anger of God and take that to the cross. Lord, by your spirit, settle these things deeply into our minds and into our hearts, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. The Lord is our, is our rock. That means he's our secure place. It means he's our shelter as well. Thank you to the musicians as they're just coming out. They're going to lead us in singing, O oh Lord, my rock. Let's stand to sing.